The ghost type is quite unique, being immune to both the normal and the fighting type, but there used to only be one evolution line to pick from in the first generation. Then in Gen 2, we got one of my favorite ghost types, Mistrevus, but that's it. My all-time favorite ghost type has to be the new Hisuian Zoroark, but let me know what yours is down in the comments below. So do you think I can beat Pokemon Soul Silver with only these two? It's gonna be tough, since the hardcore Nuzlocke rules mean that any Pokemon that faints is boxed forever. Items from the bag are banned, I always play on set mode, and we only get to catch the very first ghost in any area. Additionally, I'm not allowed to level past the next gym leader, and this time I'm not gonna be allowing any stat boosting moves at all. So join me as I attempt to beat a Pokemon Soul Silver Hardcore Nuzlocke using only ghost types. While the Johto starters are all really sweet Pokemon, Chikorita being objectively the best, of course, none of them actually evolve into a ghost type unless you're playing Pokemon Legends Arceus. So we're gonna have to go somewhere else to find our first Pokemon. When you're with a Pokemon, going anywhere is fun. Yeah, waiting in line at the DMV is so much fun because you're here, Relicanth. Uh. There's been reports of ghost-type Pokemon appearing in Sprout Tower. Well, that is absolutely perfect, since we can find our very first encounter, King Boo the Ghastly. I go ahead and catch it and name it King Boo, which is when we run into the first real problem of the run. You see, we've got to take on the Elder of Sprout Tower, but our moveset is only Hypnosis, Lick, Mean Look, and Curse. Bell Sprout isn't too big an issue, since we can just put it to sleep with Hypnosis, then hit it with Licks until we take it out. It does end up waking up hitting us for two damage with Vine Whip, but then he sends in Hoot Hoot. Not only can this thing not be hit by Lick because of its normal type, it's got Insomnia as its ability, so we can't put it to sleep with Hypnosis. The only viable strategy is therefore Curse, which I use and then get put to sleep immediately with a Hypnosis, and I just have to hope and pray that we can take this thing out before I go down to Peck. Just before Hoot Hoot falls to Curse, it takes us down to 1 HP, but we get back to 3 after leveling to the level cap of 13. This means even though we stay asleep against Bellsprout, I can actually survive on 1 HP, then wake up and put the Bellsprout to sleep with Hypnosis. I then get a super clutch critical hit lick, which means another one does the trick and we actually beat the Elder. But even though that was an incredibly clutch, almost unwinnable victory, we have an even more difficult fight ahead of us against Faulkner, who's got two normal flying types. And when going into this fight, I thought it was potentially winnable, but a big reason for why it's not actually possible to win is because Pidgey has Sand Attack. The strategy here is simple, we need to have enough HP to be able to use Curse twice. And after that, we just need a little bit of luck with Sleep Turns and Hypnosis, and theoretically it should be possible to do this fight taking out both Pidgey and Pidgeotto with Curse. And even though Pidgey can't hit us, what throws a huge wrench in this plan is the fact that it's got Sand Attack. This means it's gonna be very unlikely that we actually manage to land a Hypnosis on the Pidgeotto, but since the Pidgey also has an uneven amount of HP, it takes five turns for Curse to take it out, which gives it one extra turn to hit a Sand Attack. Now, despite all that, I actually managed to hit my first Hypnosis so that I can use Curse, which of course leaves me at one HP. Now, unlike Pidgey, Pidgeotto's a four hit KO with Curse, so theoretically, I could get lucky with Sleep Turns and have it be taken out, but on the third turn, it wakes up and takes me out with Gust. And since I was even incredibly lucky on this attack, to even do damage to Pidgeotto, I would argue that this run with just the two Pokemon isn't possible. Or is it? You see, Heart Gold and Soul Silver have the mighty Pokewalker. And on my real DS, I have access to a couple of event routes, the Rally and the Winner's Path, which I of course have access to on my very much as real DS this run is recorded on. This feature will get us access to both Sableye and Duskull before we beat the Elite Four and a couple more encounters during the post game. However, since you get Sableye at level 15 through the event, we can only actually use Duskull, and even though we have another Pokemon, the fight with Faulkner isn't going to be that much easier. Easier. In fact, by my calculations, it's only just potentially possible. So after going through the beginning of the game, once again, capturing myself, King Boo number two, it's time to face the flying type gym leader, Faulkner. And what you'll notice is that Duskull doesn't actually have a single move that can hit normal types in its moveset either. The big advantage is that Duskull actually has Disable, so we can disable the sand attack and freely swap out into Ghastly. And now that our accuracy can't be lowered, we can go for Curse and then pretty reliably hit a Hypnosis to put the Pidgey to sleep. After a couple of turns of Curse, I decide to swap out into Duskull again to avoid sand attacks. Then after being hit by Curse a fourth time, the Pidgey is no longer disabled and of course wakes up and uses sand attack just to spite me before going down to Curse. And this is kind of a big deal, since Disable can miss and we have to disable the Pidgeotto's Gust in order to win, but fortunately, we actually get off the Disable, which means we can freely swap out back into Ghastly. My first order of business is to go for Hypnosis to put the Pidgeotto to sleep so that we can freely go for a Curse and hopefully get a few free turns of damage. 
Switch. Since Ghastly is currently at the mercy of Disable, I decide to swap out back into Shy Guy as the Pidgeotto goes down to half health from Curse. Then after one more turn of Curse, the Pidgeotto wakes up and goes for Roost, but I manage to land the Disable, which is critical since it's the only way this Pidgeotto is going to be able to heal. And so after being hit by a couple of gusts and waiting it out, we finally manage to take out the Pidgeotto with Curse and beat Faulkner. I honestly can't believe Faulkner was difficult. Now that I finally seem to have remembered to update the attempt meter, we get our third encounter, Nabbit the Sableye. What? We broke up a while ago? Guys, I really don't want to be here for this awkward relationship moment. What is going on? Anyway, our next obstacle is going to be Bugsy, and he's not nearly as difficult as Faulkner. The only moves on his entire team that can hit ghost types are U-Turn and Poison Sting, neither of which are effective at all against Ghastly. So I hit Scyther with two Nightshades as it heals up with Citrus Berry, and then U-Turns out into Kakuna, which just gets destroyed by a few Nightshades, after which I destroy the rest of the entire team. And as easy as that battle was, after after it, I make a fatal mistake and run into my rival, McFart. Eee, <laughs> tell me something, will you pull my finger? Dude, you are so immature. <laughs> Thought I was gonna have a rough go of it versus Quilava, but Nabbit actually can't have its accuracy dropped by smokescreen, so I can just take it out with a few nightshades. Arriving in Goldenrod, I get offered a job at the radio tower. Today, coming to you live from the Goldenrod radio tower to talk about extreme water sports, this is the Golden Shower Hour. Wait, who was it that named this show? You know what, I think I'm gonna be sticking to the gym challenge, and and our next opponent is Whitney and her infamous Miltank. And even though we have ghost types, Miltank can hit us with Stomp because it's got the Scrappy ability. Oddly enough, after going for Fake Out and Headbutt, Whitney actually withdraws Clefairy and I headbutt the Miltank instead. I swap into Shy Guy who takes a massive amount of damage from Stomp. I risk both the Crit and the Flinch, heal up with my Citrus Berry, and manage to disable the Stomp, which is huge. I then swap in King Boo 2 with the intention of going for Curse, but I get hit by Attract and decide to risk it and manage to pull through, hit it with a Curse as Miltank starts to go for Rollout. I decide to swap into Nabbit since Rollout could be a massive problem if it isn't checked. I decide to go for Fake Out thinking it'll put it in range of curse, but it survives on what must be 1 HP. Whitney then of course heals with a super potion as I hit it with a headbutt. I then go for protect to stall out yet another turn of curse, and the next turn Miltank goes for an attract, but Nabbit breaks through and headbutts our way to glory. Since Whitney switched, Clefairy's still in the back, but another headbutt seals the deal and we beat the normal gym. A higher level Pokemon doesn't always win. After all, it may have a type disadvantage. I don't think there's a single Pokemon that's the toughest. Yeah, no, there isn't like an obvious contender or anything. After my victory in Goldenrod, I head to the casino to pick up some TMs and make my way to Acrutique City. And here, after kicking McFart's smelly butt, Ghastly gets to level 25, which means it evolves into a Haunter. And here I had this grand plan to beat Morty where I EV trained Haunter enough to be able to outspeed the Gengar, but what happened in reality is that Nabbit just resists the entire gym and without trouble could just take out every single Pokemon. Sometimes brute forcing your way through is way more effective than intelligence. My name is Balba. Dude, no one cares. Like, literally nobody asked. Since my heart goes out to Amphi, I decide to go to Cianwood City to pick up the medicine, and while there, we encounter Chuck. And listen, I'm personally no stranger to training in weird positions, but standing under a waterfall seems like it would be absolutely brutal. However, Chuck is a fighting type gym leader, which gives our ghost types an advantage. I lead with Shy Guy wanting to go for Curse, and I get hit by a rock slide, I don't get flinched, and I actually have enough health to be left at 10 HP. I then go into Nabbit, who manages to dodge a rock slide, which means that the Primeape is going to take some more Curse damage before I can use Fake Out and take it down into healing range. Two headbutts combined with the Curse damage is enough to take out the Primeape, which means we only have to deal with Polyrath. I switch in King Boo expecting either a Surf or a Hypnosis and I get put to sleep but a Lumberry cures that right off. I then go for a Wide Lens Accuracy Boosted Hypnosis on my own which guarantees that I can take out the Polyrath with a couple of Thunderbolts. Why does Chuck just have two Pokemon? They need to give this man a boost. With my gym badge in hand, I head back to the lighthouse to give Amphi the medicine, and as we leave, we once again get called by Balba. I told you that nobody- Oh, we get access to Route 47? That's actually pretty cool. Especially since it's the location of the only other encounter we're gonna get, Mistrevis. At least before the Elite Four, and so I capture it and name it Kamek. Not only is it our only encounter before the Elite Four, we can't even evolve it until afterwards. My journey then takes me to Mahogany Town, and shortly after, the Lake of Rage where we have to fight the Red Gyarados. And since we have Thunderbolt on Kamek, this really shouldn't be a big deal at all, but unfortunately, I misclick and go for Psybeam here, which means I can get off a bite, which we survive on 6 HP, so that was a close throw. While we're at the Lake of Rage, though, we might as well pick up the Choice Specs, which are going to be super 
super useful since we can't use stat boosting moves. We then help Lance to take on Team Rocket and become an accomplice of manslaughter. I mean, what else do you expect from a guy who has an illegal level 40 Dragonite? Miss Unova, you're the best. Yeah, well, you're the worst. Our next opponent is Old Man Price and his Ice Types. And right off the bat, I lead with Choice Specs Kamek to just take out the seal in one hit and swap out right away into Shy Guy as soon as Piloswine comes out. It uses Hail the first turn, but then goes for Blizzard, which takes me under half, but I heal up with Citrus Berry and miss a Will-O-Wisp. Another Blizzard takes me low, and I even miss Disable. I go ahead and swap into Nabbit to tank another Blizzard, but after using Fake Out, I realize that Nabbit can't really do much here, and I swap into King Boo. Blizzard hits hard, and then I miss my Hypnosis but Piloswine misses Blizzard, so we live to see another day, and Hypnosis puts the Piloswine to sleep, and the combination of two Shadow Balls is enough to take it out. Dugong is Price's final Pokemon, so I go ahead and swap back into Choice Specs Kamek, who has to eat an Aurora Beam before outspeeding and then just one-shotting the Dugong with a Thunderbolt. I then right away decide to go for our next gym challenge versus Jasmine and her Steel types, and I lead with Nabbit going for a Fake Out, but after going for a Substitute, I realize that her Magnemites want to go for Thunder Wave for some reason, even though I'm behind a sub. In fact, they consistently went for Thunder Wave every time, even though I'm behind a sub, so I freely take both out and then swap out into Duskull as soon as Steelix comes in. First it misses with a Screech, and then hits me hard with an Iron Tail, but I retaliate with a Will-O-Wisp that actually hits this time. I then even manage to disable the Iron Tail, so my luck has clearly turned, and I go ahead and swap out into King Boo. Since I'm not afraid of the damage this thing can do at all, I decide to go for Curse, heal up with a Citrus Berry as the Steelix goes for a Sandstorm, only to then get a critical hit Shadow Ball, rendering all my preparation useless. With Mischievous, I look good as a Rocket Grunt. Doing a Nuzlocke in HeartGold and Soul Silver, facing Petrol can be kind of a gamble sometimes, since he loves to go boom with all of his coughings and wheezing. However, that's not something we're going to worry about at all since we're using ghost types, and on top of that, Choice Spec Psybeam just tears through his entire team. While fighting some Rocket Grunts, King Boo gets to level 37, and since I'm using the Universal Pokemon Randomizer to allow for impossible evolutions, it actually evolves into a Gengar. And it also so happens that reaching level 37 evolves Duskull into Dusklops. We then find and rescue the director in the basement, who where, where are my pants? And to avenge him, we take on Archer, who's pretty scary since he's got a couple of dark types. But King Boo easily handles the situation using Focus Blast, and we don't miss because of the wide lens. Our fateful journey then takes us through the ice path to Blackthorn City, where our next opponent is the final gym leader of Johto, Claire and her dragon types. And Claire is a big step up in difficulty versus the last few gym leaders, but I lead off with King Boo and immediately take care of the Gyarados with a Thunderbolt. Next up, she's got a couple of Dragonairs that I deal with in the exact same way, putting them to sleep with Hypnosis and taking care of them with a couple of Shadow Balls. This leaves only the biggest threat on her team, Kingdra, and I have to put this thing to sleep, otherwise I could lose a Pokemon, but I miss Hypnosis, so the next turn I have to risk it and I end up hitting it. I then go ahead and swap out into Kamek as the Kingdra stays asleep to pull off my strategy and use Perish Song. So as long as I can have all my Pokemon stay alive for three more turns, I win the fight. I hit it with a Thunderbolt, but it wakes up and takes me down low with a Hydro Pump. I then swap into Shy Guy, who tanks the Dragon Pulse fairly well, and I get a clutch Hydro Pump miss, which means that the Kingdra goes down to Perish Song and I claim my last Shoto badge. Now for the life of me, I don't get how Claire can't pass the Dragon Quiz. The answer is so straightforward. What does she answer? Her Pokemon are her subordinates and she spits on them? Can I be one of them? We just had a group of beautiful kimono girls looking for you. Yeah, girls are waiting for us. I never thought beating five kimono girls could be so hard. I got beaten to a pulp. Dude, you were supposed to fight them in a Pokemon, but never mind. The only one of the kimono girls that I was really worried about was the first one with the Umbreon, but I managed to put it to sleep and hit it with a Focus Blast, but it wakes up on the first turn and confuses me, so I decide to swap out into Nabbit. This is exactly the type of annoying thing you can expect from Umbreon, and even Nabbit got confused and hurt itself, but since I can't take that much damage from these Dark Pulses, I eventually take it out with a Shadow Claw. Then after taking out Lugia, it's time to make our way to the Kanto region. You've taken your first steps in a Kanto! What are you, border control? Get out of my way! We then make our way to Victory Road, which, much like the last two slots of our team, is empty. And so to make up for that fact, I have Dusclops hold the Reaper Cloth, which means that it evolves into a Dusk Noir as it levels up because of the Universal Pokemon Randomizer instead of having to trade. We can also find the TM for Earthquake, which conveniently can only be taught to Dusk Noir on our entire team. We swiftly destroy McFarts at the end of Victory Road, which leaves us at the Indigo Plateau. 
Now the bad news is, we only have four Pokemon to get through the entire Pokemon League, but the good news is, we've got all four of them alive. Another piece of good news is that Will is a Psychic type user, so Specs Shadow Ball from Gengar is going to tear through his entire team, so we can swiftly move on to Koga. Known mostly for his annoying evasion strats, this guy can be a real pain, but we deal with both Ariados and Muk with just Spec Psybeam. He does try to be sneaky with a Minimize, but we land the second Psybeam and take it out, and in comes Crobat. It of course goes for a double team, but I hit the Psybeam the first time, and the second time I'm not as lucky, so not wanting to risk a crit, I swap into King Boo, who misses his first Thunderbolt, but the second time we land the hit and get rid of this annoying Crobat forever. The next Pokemon is Venomoth, who's guaranteed gonna go for a Psychic, so I go ahead and swap out into Nabbit, who of course has the immunity. Realizing this thing can barely touch me, I go for a Substitute, and Venomoth tries to go for Toxic for some reason. I don't understand why the AI is fascinated by going for status moves when I have a substitute up, but it makes for a lot easier gameplay. Oratrice then comes in, and this thing only has Explosion and Swift to attack, so it can't hit our ghost types at all, so I'm free to use Perish Song and just swap out into Dusk Noir, wait out a couple of double protects, and eventually Fortress's song comes to an end, and we've defeated Koga. And so we take on Bruno, the man with more brawn than brain. And his Hitmontop can't actually hit the half of our team that have Levitate as their ability, since it's got Dig fighting, and normal moves. And so a second Psybeam takes it out, and in comes Hitmonlee, and Psybeam does a little bit over half as it goes for a Swagger, which confuses me, but I've got the Lumberry to cure it. I then get a super low roll that doesn't take out the Hitmonlee, and it crits me down to 2 HP. So I decide to go for another Psybeam, as Bruno uses a full restore, and then swap out into King Boo, who can tank a Blaze Kick fairly well. I take it out with a Shadow Ball, and in comes Hitmonchan, which I hit with a Shadow Ball as well, as I get hit by Ice Punch, and take it out with another one. Onyx is up, and this thing really isn't a threat, so I see it as a perfect opportunity to swap into Shy Guy as it misses a Rock Slide, and I can just go for a couple Earthquakes to take it out as it does pitiful damage to me with an Earthquake of its own. This leaves only his terrifying Machamp, and it goes for a Rock Slide the first turn, which flinches me, but luckily a Citrus Berry keeps me healthy enough to tank another one, and this time I don't flinch and manage to hit a Will-O-Wisp because of no guard. I then swap into Nabbit to see if I can stall this thing out, and at first it's looking pretty good, but a Citrus Berry means that I have to do way more damage than I thought I would. I also thought Bruno only had one full restore, but since he has two, after the burn damage, it puts him in range to where he's gonna use it. This is incredibly bad since it gets rid of the burn, but my second Shadow Claw actually gets a lucky crit, which means that we can outspeed the next turn and just take it out with a final Shadow Claw. And where we got out lucky in that fight, this one is a whole different story versus the manager's nightmare. I begin by putting Umbreon to sleep and of course miss a Focus Blast and proceed to hit one the next turn, but it doesn't quite take it out, and Umbreon wakes up and of course goes for Double Team, but we can hit through with a Thunderbolt. Murkrow suffers the same fate, and then it's time for Houndoom, and since I'm holding the Culberberry, I feel confident going for one Thunderbolt, but it doesn't do as much damage as I was hoping for, so I swap out into Nabbit. And Nabbit takes way too much damage from Dark Pulse, using Fake Out only to give the Houndoom more health with Citrus Berry, and ultimately being taken out. Since I put a Culberberry on Shy Guy, we can at least tank a Dark Pulse and take this thing out with an Earthquake, but losing Nabbit right here at the end before the champion is such a big deal. This Gengar isn't a threat at all, but I disable its only Ghost-type move, and we can just knock it out with a Shadow Ball. This leaves only Vileplume, and Shadow Ball does massive damage as it paralyzes us with Stun Spore. Since I resist Petal Dance, though, I'm really not afraid of this thing at all, even though I'm at pretty low health, and I can just take it out with another Shadow Ball, leaving us with at least three Pokémon to face the champion with. And so the time has come to take on the criminal warlord himself, Lance. I sat for about an hour, building as good a strategy as I possibly could, and even then, we still have to take chances. But with the life orb that you find in the ruins of Alf, and the EVs that I got for Haunter to face Morty's Gengar, we can outspeed Aerodactyl and Charizard, one-shotting them with Thunderbolts. Here's where the gambling starts. We put the Dragonite to sleep, and then start hitting it with Shadow Ball, just hoping it doesn't wake up. And after the second Shadow Ball, Dragonite stays asleep so I can take out the level 50 Dragonite with a Shadow Ball and do the exact same thing to the next Dragonite coming in. This one only takes two Shadow Balls to take out, so it requires less luck for me to take it out, but for the final Dragonite, I didn't want to risk it. I'm definitely going to need Gengar if I want to get through Kanto, so I swap into Kamek who dodges a Blizzard, which means the Focus Sash is intact and we can survive the Dragon Rush, not flinch, and hit it with Perish Song. This means we might be able to keep Kamek, so I swap out into Shy Guy who gets hit hard by Dragon Rush, but Citrus Berry brings brings it up to where we can live another one. I use Protect to stall for another turn of Paris Song, but then I go for an Ice Punch, and the Dragon Rush takes me down to 3 HP, I flinch, and the Parish Song takes out the Dragonite for the win. 
and I can't believe that I managed to get to this point in the game with three members still left in my party. But even though we've become the champion, our adventure isn't over yet because Professor Elm gives us the ticket to go to Kanto. And so we set sail on my favorite form of transportation, arriving in Vermilion City. And now that we're finally in the post game, we can get our next two encounters, Peach from the Icy Mountain Road, and Piranha Plant the Spear Tomb, who's immediately added to the team, but we're gonna have to wait until we can get a Frost Lass for Snow Runt. I then do my best to dodge the biker gangs to arrive in Fuchsia City. But before challenging the gym, I go back to the Pokeathlon, which now in the post-game actually just sells Dusk Stones so that we can finally evolve Miss Drevis into a Miss Magius. I then commence the hunt for the Kanto badges by sweeping through Janine's team with Choice Specs Psychic. And Sabrina is soon to follow, getting wrecked by Specs Shadow Ball. We then start to investigate exactly what the heck is going on at the- I'm ready to blast something! Oh boy, I think Karen got here first. Oh, I guess this guy stole the part. Can't believe Lance kept one of you guys alive. Not now, Mom. I'm fighting crime. Gotcha. We then proceed to ruin Misty's date, then her team, and probably her whole day. I then find out that Lieutenant Surge has a not-so-shocking weakness to Earthquake. Oh no, no, no! We've been off the air since the power plant shut down. All my efforts to start this station would be wasted if I can't broadcast. I'll be ruined! Buddy, I know what you mean. I've got a YouTube channel with live in the name, and I'm barely ever live! More streams on Twitch coming soon. Probably. My next move is stealing the leftovers from the Snorlax blocking the way. A bunch of Diglett popped out of the ground. That was surprising. You're surprised by Diglett. In Diglett Cave? Either way, we make our way through without surprises and take out Brock to collect our next gym badge. <laughs> it's an earphone song contest, and we don't even get to eat for free. That's just a dream come true. Okay, Maylene is my kind of girl, but you know who isn't? Erica. So I take her out and claim her gym badge for my own. Do you put a lot of thought into naming your Pokemon? I mean, yeah, I generally stick to a theme, and sometimes it takes several hours to- There's Spiri, a Spiro, and Ratty, a Ratata. Okay, you guys clearly don't. What the fuck? Anyway, serious question. Why have they rebuilt a Pokemon Center on Cinnabar Island if there's nothing else here? Like, why would anybody go here? Honestly, the Kanto badges have been pretty easy to collect up until this point, and even Blaine gets absolutely humiliated. I feel so sorry for Blaine. He lost his gym. Not only that, he lost his home, his hair, recently his dignity. I feel sorry for him too, to be honest. But now that the easy fights are behind us, it's time to take on the final gym leader of Kanto, Blue himself. And I start out the fight by annihilating Executor with a Shadow Ball as Arcanine comes in and I put it to sleep with a Hypnosis. I then go ahead and swap into Shy Guy, but this is pretty risky since if Arcanine ever wakes up, we take massive damage from a Flare Blitz, but what ends up happening is Arcanine is a sleepy boy and we just get to take it out with a couple of Earthquakes. Next up is Rhydon, and getting crit by a Stone Edge would be absolutely crippling, and our Earthquake doesn't even do half, so two Earthquakes puts it in healing range, so I decide to swap out into Kamek. I know I can survive one non-crit Stone Edge here, so I go for the Shadow Ball, but it actually misses, so we can take it out, and in comes Machamp. Since we're at full health, I decide to risk the Stone Edge crit again, and it doesn't get it, so I can take the Machamp out with another Psychic. Gyarados, of course, gets destroyed by a Thunderbolt, and in comes the final Pokemon Pidgeot, which doesn't quite get KO by a Thunderbolt, but goes for Whirlwind and swaps us out into the perfect Pokemon King Boo. This means we can finish things up with a Thunderbolt and move over to Gramps' house to pick up Rock Climb. And all of that preparation means that we can finally find a Dawnstone at the top of Mount Silver. I mean, I suppose it's better late than never, but I could've used this Frostlass a long time ago. It would've been great to use against Lance, for instance. And after a bit of training, the team is finalized and ready to go to face the strong Strongest trainer in all of Kanto. It all comes down to whether or not we can beat this fight, and Red starts out with a Pikachu, so I go for Shadow Ball, taking it out in one hit. King Boo then goes for his signature Wide Lens Hypnosis, which means I can take out the Lapras in two hits without getting hit back, which is a huge threat off my back. Then comes Blastoise, and I go for Thunderbolt again, which leaves it in the red at very low HP as it hits me with a blizzard for not too much damage. But since I'm faster, that effectively means that I get to use Thunderbolt twice here and just take out the Blastoise for free. Fourth is Snorlax, and expecting a crunch, I swap in a Piranha Plant, but it actually goes for Blizzard, which does about a fourth. I then take a crunch pretty comfortably and go for Curse to get passive damage on this thing since there's no great way for me to do damage to a specially tanky normal type. Because of the damage I took from Curse, Hail leaves me at 4. HP, and because of leftovers, I can go for a turn of Protect here to get some more curse damage on Snorlax. Then to preserve Spiritomb, I swap into Shy Guy as Snorlax goes for Blizzard, but of course Red has a full restore to heal up all the way back to full health. 
Earthquake actually does a surprisingly huge amount of damage, and so after a couple of Earthquakes, it's actually Hail that does Snorlax in and not the Curse. But all this means is that Dusknor is gonna have to face off against Charizard, who outspeeds and hits with a Flare Blitz, leaving Shy Guy on 11 HP, and Ice Punch barely does any damage, and this time Hail does me in. However, I can now freely swap in Kamek, outspeeding and taking out the Charizard with a Thunderbolt. I then go for a Pear Song as Venusaur goes for Sleep Powder, and since I have four Pokemon left, even if it took one of my Pokemon out with every hit it had, I'd be guaranteed the win. At the end, I even kept going for Destiny Bond if this thing tried to go for a move that could take me out, but all it's got is Giga Drain, which means that in the end, Parish Song takes out the Venusaur, and I claim the victory over this run. And so that's how I beat a Pokemon Soul Silver Hardcore Nuzlocke using only Ghost types. And I thought this would take me way more attempts than two, and I actually only have the two deaths to boot. So let me know what you thought about this video down in the comments below, and recommend what challenge I should be doing next. But until we see each other next time, have a good one.